Hello, I'm Michelle Cahill, and welcome to the XQ Expert Series. Today, we're talking about technology and learning for an interconnected world. We know that the use of technology needs to be woven into the fabric of a school, not patched on top of other plans. How do we do that? Today, we'll be asking how schools can use technology wisely to support student learning and enhance, not replace, strong relationships with teachers. Our guests today are Monica Martinez, a leading expert on high schools and former president of New Tech Network. Monica is the co-author of Deeper Learning, in which she identifies schools around the country that are really pushing to transform the experience of learning for their students. Nicole Pinkard is Associate Professor of Computing and Digital Media at DePaul University. In 2006, Nicole founded the Digital Youth Network, which has made digital media tools accessible to thousands of Chicago teenagers. Mary Ryersey is Director of Strategic Design at Getting Smart. Mary is a former high school teacher and administrator with extensive experience in educational technology. She's also the co-author of the book Smart Cities That Work for Everyone, Seven Keys to Education and Employment. Welcome. At XQ, we think of technology as a tool that can vastly expand student learning if it's truly built into the design of a school. Mary, would you kick us off? So I think, Michelle, as you alluded to, as we talk about design, one of the big questions is design for what purpose? And in the case of schools, as you described, the goal is really to expand learning and enhance relationships. Technology integration has great power to do exactly those things. By expanding learning, it can also allow for personalized learning and deeper learning and really getting a sense of what students' interests, strengths, and futures may hold so that their learning can be customized. It really comes down to how are we going to engage students? Because in the end, whether you're talking about curriculum or technology, we can have the best design in the world. And if it doesn't take into mind the goals of expanding learning and enhancing relationships, it doesn't matter. Monica, what have you seen? What I loved most about all the schools that were in my book was that technology was really invisible. It was really just a part of who the students were, a part of who the teachers are. When I would try to get them to talk about how they use technology, they looked at me like, do I ask you how you breathe? It's just that natural. And I think that's where we have to move to, where technology really is just invisible. I want to piggyback on that. That's a great point, Monica. Infrastructure is invisible when it works well. It's not invisible when it doesn't work well. And so it's really important. Many of the uses of technology we've talked about does require districts and schools to allocate some resources to the team who helps to make it run. Nicole, you're both a computer scientist and one of the earliest pioneers in engaging young people in new ways of learning through technology. What's your thinking about integration and school design? And how have educators been changing their thinking about technology? One of the things that's changing for me is the notion of creators versus curators. I think in the earlier days, the assumption was when websites became popular that every teacher was going to build their own website. And I think we're beyond that now, and it's much more of teachers curating learning opportunities for their students and understanding how to connect them. The challenge for us now is to apply all of that outside of school too. I think we can really expand the where learning happens to not just in the walls of school so that students are reminded about their, you know, their home communities, the parks, the libraries. Now think about experiential learning outside. One of the things that happens with kids is they feel that, you know, there's this boundary between here's how I learn in school and here's how I learn outside of school. So I think part of what we would like to see with technology is to continue to break down those boundaries and to allow learning to happen just at any moment of inspiration. I want to bring Monica into the conversation. What's your thinking about this issue of integration of technology? Thanks, Michelle. I think, you know, on the most basic level, I'm going to go real basic here. Schools need to reflect our lives. And are we asked as adults, as employees, as employers, as citizens to do our work without technology? And if we were told to do our work without technology, could we actually be effective in our professional lives, nonetheless our personal lives. So on a very basic level, schools need to reflect the reality of the 21st century and to let students be able to do what they do, like they do in their real life, that they do in school, and that's using technology. 
But the question doesn't start with which technology should I use in schools. The two key questions are, how do I give students voice when they're in school? And how do I empower students when they're in school? And again, one way you do that is by giving them access to real tools, giving them access to real information, giving them access to real people, giving them access to real research, and all that can be done through technology. We have to look at laptops, desktops, tablets, smartphones, educational software, just as one tool that's part of the learning process. And we need to start with what do we want students to learn today and how best can they learn and that's how we're going to look at the different tools that we're going to provide. I agree with everything that Monica said. If you think about the last time something happened in society, how did you hear it? What's the format in which you heard it in? If you heard it in a digital format, then we have to ask ourselves, are we preparing our students to be able to create and share their ideas in those same formats? So Digital Youth Network starts with the premise that all kids need to be digitally literate. They need to understand how to represent their ideas using all the different art forms and the media forms that we consume daily ourselves. It uh, goes back to Monica's point about schools need to reflect what happens in our everyday lives. But we know that traditional ways of developing literacy, uh, particularly of students of color, hasn't always been as successful. So how could we uh, develop students' ability to be literate with digital technologies in ways that might be more connected to pop culture, but then to spend a lot of time working with teachers to figure out how to create lesson plans that would bring some of these digital literacies into the traditional school day. So it's great that a kid can make a video, but how do you help them translate those same video skills into representing their understanding of science? In the school day, the science teacher can't be responsible for teaching how to create videos. That skill set needs to be taught someplace else. So for us, we use media arts classes to develop those literacies. When you do that, you end up with a lot more technology integrated into the school day because your teachers who really understand the content are more likely to use digital artifacts in their class if they don't have to be the people responsible for teaching the skill set. Mary, you've been a high school teacher and a district curriculum director in both Washington State and Minnesota. Can you give us some promising examples of how teachers are using technology to support creators, how they are curators, and how they essentially are enhancing the curriculum? So I was talking with the teacher just last week. This particular teacher... She said, I tell my students they deserve the same level of service that they'd get when they go to the doctor. And if they had a broken ankle, that student's not going to walk in the doctor's office and hear from the doctor, well, I'm going to treat your shoulder because that's what all my other patients need help with today. And in the example of her math class, one student really needed support with evaluating algebraic expressions. Another needed support with working with exponents. So she was able to curate and provide resources to meet students where they were and help them pursue the learning they needed for that day. We can also look at how technology in its proper place can impact school culture and school learning. Michelle, I remember listening to one of the earlier XQ Expert Series podcasts, and it was on teaching and learning, and Derek Pierce from Casco Bay in Maine talked about how at their school, they've really chosen to lead with the relationships to bring to life the relevance and the rigor for students and how important technology was for all of those pieces. Relationships, rigor, and relevance can all be enhanced really through the technology. Mary, I really like how you pointed out the importance of relevance, rigor, and relationship. At least in our experience, the use of technology strengthened the relationships between students, relationships between teachers and parents, relationships between students with teachers who they're no longer in their class. The rigor, we found one of the best benefits of technology for us has been the ability for students to see the work of other students and to hold themselves accountable for trying to improve their work. Often, kids don't see each other's work. If you turn in an essay, no one else gets to see your essay besides you and the teacher. It's the same analogy in sports. When you see someone who can you know, shoot better than you, run better than you, if that's what you want to do, then you put in the practice. And with the use of showcase tools, oftentimes the digital artifacts that students do are shared beyond the walls of the classroom. And that has gone a long way for us to see students willing to iterate on the work if they know that it's going to be public. We've just been hearing Nicole talk about how technology can help peer relationships. Monica, can you give us some examples of what you've seen in different high schools that have been rethinking student-centered learning? Yeah, I think what technology can do related to student-centered learning is it has this really kind of 
fun and rather liberating opportunity for students to be able to engage with learning materials and with each other like you've never seen before. And so, you know, suddenly, going to Nicole's point, they're producers, right? So one of my favorite classes that I saw at High Tech High was uh, a history class and a government class where students were studying about immigration and legalization and everything around history and all the recent laws around DREAM Act and everything. But they had to write their own personal immigration story, whether that was about themselves, whether that was about their parents. And then the students group edited their stories to actually publish them in a book. So they now become publishers. And it's a very different way that they're interacting with learning materials. They're actually using their own life as a way to learn and have context with real meaning. At MC Square, they had a fab lab that was really kind of the beginning of the makers movement. So they might be studying about geometry in their math class, and then they might go down to the design lab and create a Koch snowflake that reflected the key principles they learned in geometry. Then that Koch snowflake actually becomes a lighted ornament that goes on a tree that is then showcased in the community park. So it really goes to the point that they can become producers. But it doesn't always have to be the the most sophisticated technology because over at Casco Bay that you guys were just talking about, the juniors always do a multimedia documentary their junior year. They are taught about certain periods of history and certain pieces of literature, and they are taught how to capture oral history through various technology, just recording, filming, still shots. It allows students to engage with learning materials differently, and then it allows them to engage with each other differently and to be able to collaborate towards a shared purpose where they're actually producing something together that uses the strengths of all of the members. In most high schools today, time is a constant and student learning is a variable. In other words, students spend a set amount of time in school and set amounts of time learning particular subjects, but how much they learn varies widely. Seat time requirements come from an era when, as a country, we were trying to make sure that all young people actually got a full-time education. I'd like to ask all of you for thoughts on how technology can get us closer to a system where students are truly building toward mastery, not fulfilling static seat time and content requirements. Sure, I'd be happy to jump in there, Michelle. So I think when we look at seat time requirements and competency and student mastery, when we put it in the context of college and career readiness, it really comes to life. So one example that I can share about how students can help articulate their pathways to post-secondary and career comes in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. There's an organization called GPS Education Partners, and GPS has partnered with local businesses to implement a manufacturing apprenticeship program. So this is like STEM on steroids, where students are able to complete a high school degree, earn their apprenticeship certificate, earn dollars. It's a paid apprenticeship program. Earn high school credits and a high school diploma and simultaneously earn career and technical college credits. How that is enabled by technology is for students to be able to have 20 hours a week to work in a manufacturing environment requires some creative use of time and space. And it's really the technology that allows them to fulfill their high school credits. And so under the oversight of a teacher, they're completing their social studies, math, science, and other credits using technology and also customizing those experiences to relate directly to the experiences that they're having on their manufacturing floor. So if they're working with measurement and geometry, then that's going to apply in their daily job. So that's one example of how technology can provide opportunity for a variety of articulated career paths. It's really all about how many doors can we leave open for students. A person might think manufacturing internship and automatically think an associate's degree. Well, in fact, some of these students who are getting this experience will go on to get a PhD in engineering and really be designing manufacturing processes and and innovating and inventing products of the future. One other example is a student who was interested in medicine. His high school didn't offer Latin as language, but he was very interested in learning Latin to expand his opportunities and prepare him for his career path. So a student can go to a traditional high school setting and still take one or two classes in an online format from some of the many providers in our country. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I like most about the use of technology 
and trying to disrupt the use of time in terms of seat time is really kind of the transparency that technology provides to student learning, to students themselves. And, and that's because most of the schools that really focus on students having these personalized learning paths have some type of learning management system that embeds some form of rubrics, dashboards, whatever you want to call them, that is very clear in terms of the competencies or the knowledge, content, and skills that students are expected to learn before they're able to go to the next level. You have to be clear in what you want students to know and be able to do, and I really think that's part of the reason why we haven't moved forward on disrupting time is because we're not clear what we want students to know and be able to do. But once you embed these dashboards or these rubrics into a learning management system, students can say, hey, I'm doing really well here. I'm not doing so well here. It was great when we were trying to start a new tech in that we were able to tell teachers and principals and students alike, your parents will be able to know how your student is doing in real time. You don't have to wait for the quarterly report card. You don't have to wait for a progress report from the teacher. You can automatically log in to the school's website, look up your student, and you're easily going to be able to see all the learning outcomes that your students are being held accountable for. And then there will be a rubric, or for the lack of a better word, a chart that will tell you how the student is doing with an actual number or a grade that goes with it. Therefore, parents as well as students know where they stand and they can have a conversation about this in terms of the type of strategies that students need to engage in to improve on their work. Nicole, you're an expert in cognitive science. What do teachers need to know about technology and the science of adolescent learning? I think one of the key issues that we need to talk about is motivation. Kids have to be motivated to learn, and particularly kids coming from under-resourced environments where they're not necessarily coming from homes where they can look around and say, if I spend the next 20 years focused on school, I know where the positive outcome is going to be. You have to then think about how do you make learning relevant on a daily basis. So we've thought of the use of technology from a social learning standpoint. So how do you help teachers understand how they're creating an environment where students are connected to each other? They can see the relevance of what's taking place. One really interesting area of work we've seen is the use of badging, where we have students' work assessed by experts in the field. And so when students see their creative their poems, their videos, their stories that have been assessed by real writers, real filmmakers, that gives a level of authenticity and motivates them to iterate on multiple times. Are we preparing our educators to use technology effectively in their teaching? What are you seeing in schools in terms of learning and leadership by teachers in this area or in teacher preparation? Well, I actually conducted a series of interviews here in California across about 20 districts. And one of the questions I asked is, do you think teachers are ready to use technology in the classroom? And most every district had a very nuanced answer to that. And it was, our teachers are coming to us with the understanding of how to use technology, but they still are not learning how to use technology in the classroom for educational or teaching purposes. Our teacher preparation programs have not really figured out how to change the paradigm so that new teachers are learning through the use of technology. We actually have to model within our teacher preparation programs the use of technology and how to be a facilitator as a teacher, how to design curriculum, how not to want to be sage on the stage and move out of the way and simply facilitate and enable and and network for our students. One of the teachers said, I want my students to go out there and go get the information they need. There's too much information out there, more than what I have, and I want to get out of their way and help them be able to go get that information. Awesome. And I think that mindset rubs off on students as well. Well, I was just talking with a a social studies teacher in El Paso, Texas, and she talked about how her mindset was, all right, we're going to use a new video editing tool. I want our students to do some digital storytelling around immigration stories in their own families. And so She's like, okay, I know what content standards I want. I don't know how to use a software, but I have this feeling that by the end of first period, those students are going to have taught me, and it'll carry through the rest of the day and through the rest of the project. And indeed, that was her experience. We're kidding ourselves. If we think we can master all the tools before the students, it won't serve anyone well. 
Myself, I am trying. I mean, we probably have all witnessed Minecraft has come onto the scene. And Minecraft is an example of a tool where I think many adults are trying to figure out its utility as a learning tool, but also trying to understand what is it that kids see in it. And as a computer scientist, I have to go to a different place of let me sit back and work with students, work with nine-year-olds and 10-year-olds, and listen to them, watch them, observe what they're doing, and then to sort of put myself back into a different type of learning stance that's more about exploration as opposed to, you know, believing that I just need to take this tool and be able to look at it in an instant and know what it needs to do. And I think what Nicole also shared is that our teachers have to be comfortable with taking risks and also failing forward. I was in a classroom last week down in Los Angeles, and the teacher was trying to show the students how to do this one project using technology. And she said in front of them, okay, I hope I don't fail, because this is you know, only my second time of trying this, but I want you guys to do it, so you know, I know you'll be sympathetic if I fail, and you'll probably understand how to do it better than I can do it. That is something else we have to begin to prepare our teachers to do, is you have to shift your role to not be this kind of autocratic dictator, but to be a facilitator and a networker and someone who's going to empower students. You have to be somebody who has that mindset that it's okay if they fail in front of their students and that there's nothing embarrassing about that. So those are some of the characteristics we have to we have to start teasing out in people who want to become teachers and they're also going to model the problem solving the critical thinking the exploration the discovery everything else we want our students to do we need our teachers to model all of that Yep. And we talk about social emotional learning and the competencies that we want to develop in students and one uh, hallmark competency is that of empathy and I think the way you just described that is a perfect example of teaching students empathy and modeling vulnerability for them. All of you have just given beautiful examples of the teacher as continuous learner. And it strikes me that this is so important for us to put technology in perspective as a critical element as we move into a new generation of teaching and socio-emotional learning. I'd like to ask each of you if you would comment on what you think is the most important change you see happening in the way we use technology in education today, and what makes you optimistic? I think what makes me optimistic is the up-and-coming generation of teachers that we have coming into the field. I believe they're optimistic. I believe they're very open-minded. I believe they've come with a growth mindset, and they come very much understanding the need for them as a student and as a future teacher to have customized experiences as part of their personal and professional lives, and therefore they want to customize learning for students. Our future teachers recognize that there's multiple choices out there, and they don't want students to be in their school and in their classroom because they have to be. They want students to be in their classroom because they want to be, and when they're in that classroom, they're extending learning beyond the school through the use of technology, through relationships, through one another, and they're really kind of changing the relationship they have with learning materials, but with learning at large. I'm really excited and optimistic about two things in particular. One is the personalization of learning for students and how their learning can not only be differentiated, but can be customized for their interests and goals. So on a macro level, old schools don't change easily. New schools aren't developed quickly. The same could be said for any of us as educators. We don't change easily. Our skills aren't developed quickly. And so one thing I'm excited about are organizations like XQ, like 4.0 schools, like many others, who are really helping to bridge that gap between what's happening in the classroom and what is being produced by the education technology companies and the resources that are available out there for students. So I'm excited both for what happens individually in the classroom and also for how many organizations are working together to maximize and enhance learning for all students. So I'm really excited about the ability of technology to extend learning beyond the walls and beyond the geographic boundaries where many students find themselves, particularly for youth who don't happen to attend the best resource schools. Technology provides access to the best books, to the best experts. So I'm really excited about being able to provide opportunities for any person to learn anytime, anywhere. I'm also excited about the opportunity to make learning more authentic and more 
realistic through the ability to share what one is learning with others and with audiences that matter. The ability to make that happen is priceless and I think can serve to motivate youth to put in the time and effort and the hours that are necessary for them to truly develop expertise. And finally, I think I'm also really excited about the use of digital badging because I think it can carry with you the record of your learning. So it's not just someone has to believe you've done something. You can show your work product and that work product can stay with you throughout multiple years. So I think it's an opportunity. The promise is there, but there's still a lot of work to realize it. With that, I'd like to thank Mary, Monica, and Nicole for their rich insights and transition into the next part of this conversation. We know that many of you have questions for these experts. Join us Tuesday night, April 26th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, 5.30 Pacific on Twitter with the hashtag XQExpertSeries, where our guests will be answering questions live.